This is the second part of our series on the central control of reproduction. We're now going to focus much more on the pituitary and gonadotrophs and GnOH itself. As always, the idea is to not fill you full of facts, but really to introduce you to concepts and ideas to stimulate your interest so you'll read around the subject rather more. So in the first lecture, we looked at how Jeffrey Harris really developed the theory that hypothalamic hormones were produced by nerves which were released at nerve cell terminals in the median eminence here. They travel down the portal blood vessels and hit the pituitary where they control the release of each of the anterior pituitary hormones. Well, we're now going to be concentrating particularly on LH and FSH coming from the anterior pituitary and they're being stimulated by the releasing hormone that was discovered by Shally and Grielman, gonadotrophin releasing hormone, always abbreviated to big G, little n, RH, GnOH. Let's look at the anterior pituitary first. It contains a variety of cell types and normally each cell type secretes one of the different anterior pituitary hormones. So you have some cells which secrete TSH. Then you have a population of cells which secrete prolactin, another population which secrete growth hormone, another one which secretes TSH, and then a population of cells which secrete both LH and FSH. They're called gonadotrophs because they're secreting the two hormones which are gonadotrophins, LH and FSH. They're called gonadotrophins because they stimulate, they're trophic to the gonads. About 15% or so of the total population of pituitary cells are gonadotrophs, and of those, 70% of the gonadotrophs contain both LH and FSH and are believed to secrete FSH and LH. So the situation we've got is we've got 70% of the gonadotrophs within the antipituitary seem to contain both LH and FSH. Those two hormones seem to exist actually within the gonadotroph in different secretory vesicles. So given that situation and the, the cell is being stimulated by GnOH coming down from the antipituitary, coming down the portal blood vessels from the median eminence, how can that single releasing hormone control the differential secretion of LH and FSH from the gonadotrophs? Because these two hormones certainly have different secretory profiles in the blood. LH tends to be much more pulsatile, the fluctuations in FSH are much more gradual. There must be some kind of differential control of the synthesis, packaging and secretion of these two hormones. There are certainly other inputs into the gonadotroph apart from GnRH. Feedback for gonadal steroids, particularly testosterone, estradiol and progesterone, certainly uh, affects LH secretion and they also affect FSH secretion, but FSH is also affected by inhibin, activin and folistatin feedback as well. So many inputs into this gonadotroph, not just GnRH, but feedback by steroids, these protein hormones, allowing the different secretory profiles of LH and FSH to be seen. Another important variable contributing to the different secretory profiles of LH and FSH is the major stimulus coming in, GnOH. It isn't coming down the portal blood vessels all the time. It's now obvious that it comes down in discrete pulses. And we're going to spend the next few minutes looking at pulsatile secretion of GnOH. GnOH had been identified as a small decapeptide, and as such, it could be easily synthesized. So it became widely available as an experimental tool. And one of the first things people did was to see to what extent the pituitary changed its sensitivity to GnRH under different conditions. And this was very revealing. Here we see a typical experiment which was done on a rat. Looking at plasma LH up on the vertical axis against time in minutes along this axis. And at this point, a single injection of GnRH, so this is synthetic GnRH, was injected into the animal and we can see the LH response. Now, at this point, we're going to inject another dose of GnRH. And what we'd expect is the second dose will probably give something very much like the first dose. But what happened? It gave a much, much bigger response. 
It looks as though the first dose of GnRH had somehow changed the pituitary's responsiveness to allow it to become much more responsive to the second dose. Similar types of experiments show that the pituitary responsiveness to GnRH was also changed by previous exposure to estradiol and progesterone in various doses. So pituitary sensitivity was not constant. It was variable depending on the endocrine environment, depending on the GnRH which was coming down and the frequency of that, and the steroid environment. And this was in the era of developing radioimmunoassays, the first time people had been able to measure hormones in the blood with good accuracy. And hormone measurements in humans of LH produced very unexpected results. This was in 1967. People had expected that LH levels might fluctuate a bit, but would be fairly slow in their fluctuations. The reality was very different. Here we are looking at plasma LH levels, repeated measurements. The radio amino assays allowed repeated measurements in small quantities of blood throughout, for instance, a 24-hour period. So lots and lots of blood samples could be taken. And look what they showed. Big pulses of LH going on throughout the day. This was totally unexpected. It wasn't the gradual fluctuations that people had been used to thinking about in terms of how, op uh, how endocrine systems operated. This was a much more dynamic system. Well, what did these pulses of LH mean? Well, let's have a look again. Here we see a slow decline in the blood and then a big increase, a slow decline, big increase, slow decline, big increase, slow decline, big increase. What it looked as though was happening was that the LH was being released from the pituitary in a big bolus, and then its level in the blood decreased with the half-life of the hormone as it was cleared. Another bolus release, clearance. Another bolus release, clearance. Another bolus release, clearance. So what does this mean in terms of how the system is operating? Here we have the same picture with the pulses of LH coming out, and we know that they're coming from this system. Here's the pituitary again, so the pituitary is secreting pulses of LH every few hours. So why should the pituitary be secreting those pulses, those boluses of LH release? Well, obviously it must be being stimulated by bolus release of GnRH. So GnRH comes down here, releases pituitary LH, then there's a delay, and then a bit later, another pulse of GnRH comes down, another pulse of LH. And if you're getting pulses of GnRH, let's work our way back into the system. It must mean that there is pulsatile activity of the neurons which release the GnRH. And not only that, those GnRH neurons must be coordinated together in some way, so that they all fire at the same time, releasing GnRH in one big bolus. The bolus comes down here, releases the LH, you get an LH peak. Then there's a delay, and then suddenly the GnRH neurons all fire again, another bolus of GnRH, another pulse. So the idea began to develop that up here, there was somehow coordination of those GnRH uh, neurons, and it was called the GnRH pulse generator. The whole thing, uh, a concept that the GnRH neurons were somehow coupled together to release the GnRH in pulses, and that drove the pituitary. Gradually, all the evidence came together to support this hypothesis of the GnRH pulse generator. Recordings of neurons up in the hypothalamus showed there was bursting activity, which correlated with GnRH pulses and LH pulses. The GnRH pulses could be measured in the portal blood vessels, and those GnRH pulses preceded each LH pulse. Here's some data from the sheep. Here are the LH pulses going up and down, and each one is preceded by a big burst of GnRH in the portal blood vessels. Big burst of GnRH, followed by the LH. So the whole system fitted. A multi-unit GnRH pulse generator up in the hypothalamus, 
the pituitary responding, changing its responsiveness in relationship to the frequency of the GnRH pulses and the steroid feedback, and the gonadotrophins coming out in response. And examples in the dynamics of the GnRH pulsatility was obvious in all kinds of situations. Here's some data from the menstrual cycle. And we can see that as you go through the menstrual cycle, on different days of the menstrual cycle, here's day two, day six, day 11. This is the luteal phase, early luteal phase, mid luteal phase, late luteal phase. The GnRH pulse frequency must be changing. The LH pulse frequency is changing being driven by the changing GnRH pulse frequency. This is changes during puberty. Before puberty, very little is going on. The system isn't being driven at all. As you go through puberty, pulse is beginning to pick up and become much more dynamic. And the system could be remarkably responsive. Here's some data from sheep, where yeastrous ewes, that is ewes in heat, were introduced to rams and the LH levels in rams was measured. This is LH levels in rams before he saw the ewes and as soon as he sees them, this is just the ewe being placed adjacent to the ram in a, in a neighbouring pen, up goes his LH levels. Simply placing the ewe with the ram directly, up goes the LH pulses. Very acute responses of the GnRH pulse generator and the LH response system. But what was the real significance of the frequency of the pulses? Did it matter how frequent they were? This was nicely addressed in an experiment done on rhesus monkeys, where this is the basic system we're looking at, the hypothalamus releasing GnOH, driving the pituitary's production of LH and FSH. To investigate the importance of that system, lesions were placed in the hypothalamus, which would stop GnOH being produced. If there was no GnRH, not surprisingly, there was no LH or FSH coming out. This system could then be used to artificially give back GnRH at various frequencies to see how the pituitary responded. So we're now going to give back GnRH and we can give it back in any way we like. We can give it back continuously, we can give it back at a physiological frequency, we can give it up back at a supraphysiological frequency, we can give it back very slowly. Let's see what the results were. This is a fairly long-term experiment, and this time course is actually in terms of days of the experiment. We're looking at LH levels up on this axis, and we're looking at giving initially a frequency which was physiological, one pulse of GnRH an hour, and we see we have nice reasonable levels of LH and actually FSH as well. Then it was changed to five pulses an hour. So increasing the pulse frequency to something much more supraphysiological and both hormones declined. So even though you're giving five times as much as here, hormone secretion from the pituitary went down. To show this was a reversible response, it was returned then to one pulse an hour and the system resumed again. Here we see a similar type of experiment where one pulse an hour to begin with, then the frequency of giving the pulses slows down. One pulse every three hours, and then it's reversed back to one pulse an hour. What happens? Well, again, LH levels drop a bit, not as much as before, and then they pick up again. FSH levels, though, well, they, if anything, go up and then drop down again when you go back to the uh, control frequency. So the take home message is the frequency of the GnRH pulses affects the pituitary sensitivity and it affects the pituitary sensitivity of LH and FSH in different ways. Let's sum up. Here we've got the pituitary again here, secreting LH and FSH in response to GnRH being released at nerve terminals in the median eminence here. And the pituitary sensitivity to that GnRH can change due to its previous GnRH exposure and the frequency with which it's seeing the burst GnRH pulses and in relation to steroid hormone feedback. So a very versatile system. 
And the versatility of that system can be seen in this very conceptual slide, uh, summarizing everything. Here's a pituitary. Under different physiological conditions, it shows changing patterns of LH and FSH secretion. Why? Because of varying feedback from the gonadal steroids, androgens, estrogens, progesterone as well. Both these feed, steroids feed back both at the level of the pituitary and we'll see later on to the various levels of hypothalamic neurons. But we also have external inputs into this GnRH pulse generator. Things like we know that diet affects GnRH pulse generator frequency. We know stress does. We know that before puberty, the GnRH pulse generator uh, is, is operating at a very low level, if at all. During lactation, it's suppressed. Uh, anorexia suppresses it. Malnutrition exercises. Very heavy exercise uh, affects it. So we have physiological changes in relation to the external world and to what's going on internally in terms of what's going on at the level of the testis or the ovary. So now the center of focus is beginning to be the GnRH neurons themselves. This is a slide of um, what they actually look like within the brain. And within the human brain, there are something like 1,500 to 2,000 separate GnRH neurons. But somehow, they've all got to be coordinated together. Let's just quickly ask the question, where do GnRH neurons come from? Because the answer is, they're unique. They actually arise outside the brain in the olfactory placode. Now this will actually become essentially the olfactory region. And they migrate during early development it, through the olfactory bulb into the hypothalamus where they colonize it and eventually give rise to the adult GnRH neurons which are responsible for the pulsatile GnRH secretion. This origin of the GnRH neurons explains one of the characteristics of Kalman syndrome. Kalman syndrome is a fairly rare genetic condition. Uh, individuals don't go through puberty, their reproductive system never develops, but it's also accompanied by a lack of a sense of smell. Individuals with Kalman syndrome are missing the olfactory bulb. So in fact, what happens is the GnRH neurons, which should, in the adult, drive the reproductive system, they don't get there because they can't migrate through this pathway during early development. So individuals with Kalman syndrome don't have GnRH neurons occupying the hypothalamus. They were blocked in early development from that migratory pathway. So thank you for listening to this short lecture. Uh, we've now established the basics of the central control of reproduction. The GnRH neurons coordinated together as the GnRH pulse generator, pulses of GnRH driving the pituitary, and the pituitary hormones LH and FSH driving gonadal function. In other lectures in this series, we'll go more into what's going on within the hypothalamus in terms of what coordinates the GnRH and how